guys, welcome back to Game Changers Podcast, uh, inspiring conversations with leaders of tomorrow. Today I have with me my co-host Jaden um, and our two very special guests, Alex, Alex Esk and Clinton Jonah. Clinton doing a double on the podcast, our first guest. Welcome back and welcome Alex, our first timer from the Gifted and Gab podcast. Uh, great to have you on, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Happy Thank to be you. here, man. All right. And just for you guys know, this is a very, this is a special podcast. Obviously, we've seen all the trouble happening uh, in the U.S. with, uh, and even in Canada, you know, with racism and all these protests taking place. And these two guys are extremely involved in the community, in activism, even in the protests taking place in Edmonton. And I wanted to bring these guys on to really have these tough conversations talking about, you know, what's been done, what we can do, and what we have to change in the future. And even just talking about the progress we've made so far to encourage and motivate people to keep going, spreading the word, creating awareness around us on a micro and macro level. Sweet. But going off of that, you know, before we get into that conversation, I'd love to um, get Alex to introduce himself first and then Clinton, if you don't mind as well. Thank you. Um, my name's Alex. I'm one half of the Gifted Gab. Uh, we're uh, a podcast. We don't look at ourselves as just a podcast. We look at ourselves as more of a platform, um, an entity that speaks. We just we speak our mind freely. You know, uh, it's observational commentary on, on social issues, uh, culture, um, current events, and, and the likes of which. Um, you know, we originally started to give ourselves voice and you know it opened a lot of doors for us to do other things within the community um being uh you know young black uh gifted um you know we're, we, uh, we're both me and my partner andre um uh, i played basketball in college he currently plays right now and we just didn't want to box ourselves into uh we didn't want to box ourselves to that uh <clears throat> that 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 box right you know so we we created this to you know extend our reach and, and hopefully inspire some people as well same thing you guys are doing so yeah and you have a lot of you've been really involved uh, heavily involved in all the stuff that's taking place i know you've had a bunch of interviews with all these news channels and talking about what can be done and even in the i know you're very you seem very humble with it but you've been heavily involved even in organization organizing and uh, the protests that took place recently yeah um you know my 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 role with the protest wasn't as defined as everybody else there was a lot of other people that had a lot of uh, you know important hands on that um but uh when it comes to you know uh representation and and, and being a voice for people in the room that's more of what i do um, that's why i decided to speak at the uh the uh public hearing um, just to make sure, you know, that the protest wasn't just a protest, you know, uh, that there was some sort of voice behind it and a reason behind it, um, and, and to apply pressure, uh, not only to the city, but, you know, to, to Canada, you know, so, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm only an expert of my own experiences, you know, and, you know, that combined with my education and, and the things I've gone through and seen and places I've worked and all that um, allows me to have a voice that's distinctive from the ones that are in the room making decisions for us, so. 100%. Thanks for, thanks for letting us know, man. And uh, Clinton, man, happy to have you back. You know, I, um, I saw all over, you're, you're leading all these protests, man. You're the face of all these protests in Edmonton, um, from the first one to, to the one that just happened most recently. I went to the protest, I heard your voice. Uh, it was just, it was a really, um, I, I guess, you know, and I, and I even messaged you right off the bat after that first protest, the big one. Uh, I, I, I was so proud uh, of the work you've done and how you used your influence for this cause, for this voice. Uh, I know you have a, a huge, um, a huge fan base, even from the, uh, a, a lot of the younger kids and the young group. And you really just setting the example straight and right, especially when they need that type of guidance. I was very, very proud and uh, 
to be able to know you and see the work you've done, man. Thanks, man. It's a blessing that I'm able to use my platform to bring about change. I never planned on being the face of it. I was just upset that Edmonton didn't have a protest. And it was like a week, a week and a half after George Floyd was murdered. Every other major city had had a protest in Canada and North America, all over the world. And Edmonton was just quiet. And that just frustrated me because that just re birth all the trauma that I've gone through in my life, you know, that's been racially charged. I'm like, Edmonton's really going to be quiet and act as if racism doesn't happen here, whether it's towards black people, towards indigenous people, towards brown people, it doesn't matter. It happens. We've all been victims of it. So I just spoke up and a lot of people agreed and a lot of people made the protest happen. I was just the one that everybody knew. A lot of people played a bigger role than I did, and I'm just happy that I was able to use my platform to bring awareness, to let these kids know what right from wrong is. Because I remember being a young kid, like rappers and people with platforms, those are the people that influenced me growing up. Like I didn't have an older brother. My dad wasn't in the picture when I was growing up, so I had to rely on other things to educate me. And as a kid, lots of times you don't choose the right things to educate yourself with. So me having a platform, it's just a blessing that I can be the change in the world that I want to see. Yeah, that's sweet. So um, why is it so important that people uh, are protesting right now? And what has changed and what can change? What change can come from this? Well, you know, protesting brings attention to what's going on. You know, um, it's easy to, to look past, uh, you know, the media and the news and all that stuff. Um, but when you're seeing the protests and you're seeing people, you know, disrupt their day to day to do these things, it, it means that these these things affect us here too. You know, it's not just what's on the TV. Because a lot of times people think, oh, it's just, you know, in the States. No. You know, a lot of those things that happen are universal. A lot of those things that happen to other people as well. Um, and, you know, when people are protesting and, and, and expressing their, you know, their, uh, their lack of contempt with these things and that they want to see change, you know, protesting puts pressure on you to say, okay, hey, this is not just something we can overlook, but it happens here too, you know, so... So talk a little bit more about that, Alex, because uh, I know there's a lot of misconceptions and um, even just general ideas that, you know, when people talk about racism, it's always, there's always this benchmark, you know, it's always compared to the U.S. first. And that's why we overlook what happens in maybe even the U.K. or Canada, because the U.S. has just created this absolutely impossible to achieve, like just benchmark of racism and um we, we always compare to that and in terms of relativity, mm -hmm. but in general, if you don't consider the U.S., what, what is the actual state of racism and, um, in, in Canada itself, or even in Edmonton, to be even more specific? You know, it really depends on what level you want to look at it, you know, because everybody knows there's levels to this. Um, you know, it, it starts, uh, you know, you can look at you know, the, the policing, you can look at the education system, you can look at healthcare. You can there's so many places you can look in, and and see uh, the, the, the system is broken. You know, um, when we start to understand the foundation of Canada, and, and peel back the history books and look at the historical context of how Canada was created, of how you know, uh, like uh, the RCMP was created, or or you know, all these different institutions. Uh, even like, you know, the school system, you know, we, we, we follow a Eurocentric school system. Um, you know, indigenous people had their own thing going on here. The only thing they didn't do is read and write. They still communicated. They had a language. They had a, a way of doing things, you know, but everything that we use in society comes from this, this act of colonialization. And when you start to understand that then you can start to understand where the system is broken and what parts is broken in. you know so that's really important and in edmonton you know it can be something as micro as you know police brutality 
which you would say is a system systematic issue. It involves individuals. And then you could say it's it's you know the education system as a whole, which would be more of a systemic issue, or it's more of a macro thing. You know, the thing about systemic racism is no one person is responsible for it. Right? It's just that certain people benefit from the system, certain people don't. You know, and if, if Canada is a land of, of, of equality and, and all the things they preach, then you know, we gotta fix these things one thing at a time. Uh, to get it to that point, you know, it, 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 there's different battles everywhere. You know, there's battles in the education system, you know, post secondary K to 12. Those are two separate battles. There's battles in police reform, right? There's, there's defunding the police, you know, investing into community, which is a big one. You know, when you start to look at it from that type of lens and, and, and see all the different, all the many, many, many problems in society. You know, can be attributed to how this stuff was was founded and how it was built. You know, it's, it's a system that's designed to protect certain individuals, not everybody. And once we realize that, then we say, okay, now we can we can pinpoint and get started in the right places. Yeah, Clinton, I'd like to I'd like for you to hear your thoughts on this. And you know, I, I we were talking earlier, and you were talking about a little bit of mi micro signs of racism in Edmonton. And I feel like those uh, are to be taken of with importance and significance because you know, these little things just build up. When people don't speak up, it's kind of giving them allowance to um, just, I guess, build on it and do even more and more. And I think a lot of that happened in the US because a l for a long time, no one really, like, yeah, there were protests, but people didn't speak up to the extent that they are speaking up to now. And I think, for us in Canada, it's a, it's really a learning lesson to look at look at them and say, hey, you know what? Instead of taking a reactive approach afterwards, we can take a proactive approach and really just create awareness before you know unnecessary lives have to be lost. And I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. It's like what Alex said. It starts in the school system. It starts at such a young age, and kids are at school more than they're at home. So if in the school system we are putting courses forward that are teaching kids about the differences of cultures and race, not just how you have a cultural day once a year and you get, you know, to have food from different areas and you see entertainment from different areas, but actually embedding it in the curriculum because the curriculum is very brainwashing and just talking about the forefathers of this country, the forefathers of the Western world, they're all white men. And if these men were alive today, they would all be slave owners. They would all be oppressors because that's who they were back then. But history doesn't talk about that part of it. They just keep it one-sided. So if from a young age, we begin having conversations with kids, we won't see all these little micro racisms, whether it's in this grocery store, on public transportation, just walking through your neighborhood. We won't see all these things because people will be more knowledgeable on the situation. And they'll know that how we can judge people is the way they act, the content of their character. And they'll know that a lot of things in society, a lot of stereotypes come from the media trying to portray an image of black people to scare those in the system who the system is built to protect. Like, that's where blackface comes from. That's where a lot of these brands like Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben's, I'm happy that they're now removing those likenesses. But how did those, how did those things get away in society for over a hundred plus years? Like we're going into the second century of having Aunt Jemima on the shelves when she was a slave. So things like that, educating our kids at the onset and giving them true education, not just one-sided education. That's how we can stem change from the root yeah that makes sense because uh i think there's a systematic flaw because the u.s so starting with the u.s they call themselves a melting pot so everyone comes in and they they're all an american and uh they don't really represent their true like culture what they were before and then canada canada says it's a mosaic where uh, there's a bunch of different cultures and you get to embrace your culture. And I don't think, uh, I don't think we do it fully here. Like we, like we say we do. Absolutely. Um, you know, the intention is, is pure, you know, and, and 
Canadians for the most part, you know, do are accepting of other races, but you know, the system itself is not. And then there are still people and in institutions and individuals that still uphold these systems and want these systems to stand in place because they are benefiting from it. Um, especially here, especially here in Alberta. Um, you know, when you talk about mosaic, um, when you talk about uh, mosaic, um, you tend to think of Toronto. Yeah. You know, uh, you tend to think of Toronto and, uh, did I cut out? Uh, yeah, your video is just uh, flickering off. Yeah, somebody was calling me, sorry. But, um, no worries. Yeah, we tend to think of Mosaic, you tend to think of Toronto, you know, which is an accepting place, which is open, which is everything that you know, they say that Canada is. But when you start to venture out of Toronto and realize, you know, that a lot of these other places are more, you know, I hate to use the word conservative because I'm not a politician, but the word is conservative and they want to conserve these, these values that their country was founded upon and they want to you know, preserve that, um, that, 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 uh, what I like to call white, uh, insecurity. You know, it's a structure of white insecurity, not white supremacy. You know, um, when they, when they want to keep that alive, then you realize that, oh, oh you know, Canada's not all that it set out to be because Toronto is just one part of Canada, you know? So yeah, when we, when we compare ourselves to the States, where our hands are not bloody, our hands are just as bloody, actually. You know, we've had slaves, we've had, you know, a Chinese head tax, you know, we there has been genocide. You know, all this stuff has happened here too, you know, and it's when uh when one person is allowed to tell the story, it's very easy to lose sight of everything else. You know, like there's no there's nothing there's nothing in Alberta that I can acknowledges, you know, all the black inventions or, or how black people uh, were integral in, in, in you know, the, the civil war that ended slavery or how they fought in World War II. You know, all this stuff, is, black people were all involved in this stuff, right? But history continues to put the white man on a pedestal, right? And that's because it's written by a white man, right? The only way you can tell your story is if you make it to the finish line. Right, so it's about that acknowledgement and, and, and understanding the historical context behind everything, too. <clears throat> yeah, and I hear you guys talking a lot about the education systems, and uh, <clears throat> so like I think going off, of that, I want to I want to hear your thoughts. You know, what can be done? So okay, we've identified the problem. What do you think? What do you guys think is the next step for uh, even Canadian government to take in? Uh, you know, you guys are just talking about education, and you know, luckily now. We're in a place and um, in a more in a mo more modern age where we have access to social media and we can educate each other and create awareness like this because otherwise, you know, we wouldn't have all this awareness. We wouldn't know all this stuff. All these issues even exist, and we would have been a victim of the institution and the sy systemic racism. But I want to hear again, going back to my main point. I want to hear what you guys have to say about what can be done to change this. What action steps? can the government or people start to execute to bring this change? So we, uh, over at the Gifted Gab, we, we have created a petition to uh, implement a mandatory anti-bias race theory course. Um, it details, you know, uh, the, the foundational context of Canada and how it trickles down into the institutions now. And um, it uses an application unit to, implement you know non-biased uh, for people that you know obviously in university you're working towards working like in society so a course like this allows you to think critically about whatever it is that you've learned up until then and and and, and prevent any biases towards minorities uh, when you're working in the public sector you know and and we have to admit that stuff does exist. You know, if you're in mental health, you know, you know, you're in a mental health clinic, you don't want to be discriminated against, or you don't want any, any stereotypes to be imposed on you because of the color of your skin. You know, if you're uh, just walking around your neighborhood, 
you don't want to be part of the racial group profiles, you know. So by making this educational, uh, this course uh, mandatory, which is what we we're trying to do, which is we've uh, directed this petition to Justin Trudeau, um, not the education ministers, not the presidents of the universities, to, to Trudeau himself, because, you know, as somebody that, you know, Trudeau is a user of our system, you know, he, he, he went to school, he educated himself, right? Um, and I think he would understand that the whole country as a whole benefit from this. Mm. Um, and we're starting with post-secondary, you know, we're starting with universities. And then um, we want to move into the colleges and, and obviously the, the K-12 schools as well, but it's, right? And, and you know, to do K-12 schools is, you know, that's a battle you have to do it across each province individually because each province has their own curriculum. But by implementing this stuff, you know, racism can be taught, which means it can also be untaught. You can teach other stuff too. It's racism is taught in the homes. You're not born a racist, right? You're not born with any preconception of anybody. So it's taught. So when you, you know, understand the fact that that stuff is, is, is ingrained in you over time, then you can work towards dismantling them as well. So that's our first step. That's what I think the first step with education looks like. There's many other organizations fighting for change, for reform in the K-12 system. Um, I know Ontario has made some changes to their curriculum. They've implemented financial literacy. They've implemented coding, you know, which means they're willing to update. Alberta's been due for a change probably for 10 years now, you know, probably longer than that. You know, and there's a lot of things that need to be changed on that level itself. But, you know, starting, I think starting with post-secondary, because that's where you're creating the future using Terrell tomorrow. I think it's a good start. And it's, you know, just one part of the, the fight, one part of the battle. Yeah, exactly. And uh, today there's lots of people, uh, they ignorantly just throw around saying like, all lives all lives matter and they think that uh they think that that means something that that supports it when it doesn't because they don't realize uh like the the problem is directly in black lives black lives matter and they don't really realize that uh what would you guys say about uh about all lives matter these people that say that of course all lives matter no one's yeah. saying they don't but black lives are the ones that are being murdered again and again on camera and nothing is being done yeah. about it. People saying blue lives, blue isn't a life. You could take your uniform off at any time. I can't clock in and out of being black. Neither can Alex. Harsh can't clock in and out of being brown. We are victimized by stereotypes that don't even describe us 24-7. And it seems like there's nothing we can do to escape it. It doesn't matter if someone is a college ed, college graduate with a PhD, working a corporate job, an athlete, an artist. It doesn't matter to the cops and to not just the cops, I'm not going to say the cops. So those who view life through the lens of prejudices, they just see a black man. They just see a color. They don't see the content of the character. So saying all lives matter is like Father's Day was on Sunday. We should be saying all men matter, right? Not just fathers. <laughs> like, yeah. All parents so, matter. Yeah, exactly. All parents matter, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, no, kind of like, so, uh, yeah, that's yeah, a good way to put it. I was just saying, is this something to just scoff at, to be honest? Because it's just like in cancel culture at, in its prime. Just, you know, when people just try to stay, stay up, so but for something, obviously there's, like you said, you know, Clinton, obviously all lives matter and uh, no one said that, but there, uh, you know, there's, I just saw this analogy online, even with the house. And I don't know if you guys saw this, but there's like two houses and one's on fire and a another one's just sitting and it's like, oh, this, there's a firefighter and it's saying, you know, my house is burning. And he's like, no, but all houses matter. But he's like, oh, my house is on fire. Someone's saying my house is on fire. That's why you got to extinguish my house first but the guy say oh all houses matter so it's like yeah of course all things matter but um, what's the priority right now what is the issue at hand that we're dealing with and that's the most important 
And um, going, off, going off of that, um, I want to talk about uh, another issue because I see this a lot where people are talking about defunding the police, right? Def everyone posting stories, defund the EPS. But I still, like, even as from my perspective, I want to ask you guys, you know, what's that going to do? What is, what is defunding the police going to do for us as citizens? Well, defunding the police is only one half of uh, the equation. Um, when you understand how much money gets pumped into policing, you tend to realize that, you know, why isn't this much money being pumped into the community, into social services, into um, affordable housing, into transit, into community integration? So when you start to look at the numbers and say, holy smokes, that's a lot of money for militarization of equipment, for a gun range, for, you know, extra cops to be on the scene, you know, over policing, you know, Timmy's cards that, you know, with free freaking coffees and stuff on it. When you think about all this money that's being invested into policing, which is a reactive solution, think about what would, how it would work if, you know, you invested a fraction of what you invested in policing into affordable housing. So there aren't people that are homeless on the streets. So there isn't crime all over the place. You have a place for people to stay right um if you invest into communities centers spaces for youth you know the, the leaders of tomorrow to have a space to go to after school as opposed to getting involved with you know people that aren't doing stuff so that you know what i mean it's, it's, it's taking that proactive approach to you know humanity because policing is just it's strictly throwing money at a problem and expecting it to go away you know you you, when you send, when you call 911 on someone, that's a reaction or a solution. When you have someone that's there from the community that can, um, you know, uh, what's the word, de-escalate situations, you know, or when you have social service workers that are, that are able to be on call, mental health workers, because you've seen what's been going on with the mental health checks. And so many of them are going wrong and it's, it's disgusting it's despicable it's like how can you call the police on someone that needs help and then they end up dying you know what i mean like the, that's let's yeah, talk about that because i know there was this one case <laughs> with uh ejaz chaudhary recently in toronto i don't know if you heard about that yeah, so, heard it, yeah. yes yeah so uh, i'd like for you to you know hear your thoughts on that yeah, like, just just what I was saying, you know, like, when you pick up the phone and call 911 and, and, and you have a, a team of, you know, uh, 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 what, I don't know what the team is called, but those guys are not guys that are coming to de-escalate the situation. They don't understand what's going on. They don't understand, you know, that this man has mental health issues. You're coming in there to take control of the situation, and it ends up with someone being dead. You know, that's reactive. That's a reactive solution. The person called because they needed help. They didn't call because they needed you to take somebody out. This person wasn't a danger to anybody. He was just going through an episode, you know. So like stuff like that. That's 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 that's. that's it bothers me to hear that stuff because it's like you know, like how is it that imagine if somebody close to me had something happen with them and I have and I need to call someone and I call the police and they end up killing them you know that's that's gonna weigh on your conscience for the rest of your life you know what i mean and and, and it's because you didn't have the resources to, to to call somebody else because the city hasn't invested in an alternative option you know they call for a mental health check when they call for a mental health check they send police that's wrong bottom yeah. line mm -hmm. it happens it happens so many it's it happened more often than not it happened that's the second time this month in mm -hmm. toronto I've yeah. seen it happen a few times myself. I, I've heard of the, the stories. I've heard of the balcony, the, all that stuff. You know, it's, it's I tell you, when are we going to look at this and say, oh, this is broken. It needs to be fixed. Police are yeah. not solving these issues. They're not solving the problems. So to continue to throw money at them doesn't fix this, fix anything. <clears throat> that's what, that's the whole, that's what defunding the police comes from. It comes from taking money away from these guys 
that can get carried away in situations like that. They can get carried away. That's the reality of it, you know? And investing it into de de-escalation strategies, mental health workers, social service workers, things of that nature, community. You know, that's what defunding the police. The problem is when people hear defunding the police, they think the worst case scenario. They think about abolishing the police. They think about taking power away from the police. No, it's not about that. It's about putting the money into the resources where it's going to help the community and cost less money for the city at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Right? It, it doesn't make sense to send a, a plumber to fix an electrician's problem. Yeah. You know, <laughs> nice way yeah. to put it, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And it, it's just kind of sad, too, because, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that now we're at a point that we're fearing the people that are meant to protect us. Right? You know, mm -hmm. even even us being you know uh, from the south asian community like even me or even anybody now it's they're thinking twice anyone of color any person of color is thinking twice before they call the police or you know even if you have you know your registration expires you're so a cop pulls you over you still have this fear in your in your heart that you know what if something goes wrong and and i and I, it's really sad that it's come to this because you know these people have power like so much power and so much responsibility with weapons um you know capable of taking another person's life and and i think there needs there needs to be more accountability put the, put put uh put on their shoulders there needs to be more education more training <clears throat> even more um testing for recruitment and checking the person's background values mindset because if you get the wrong person in the wrong power then you know wrong things are bound to happen Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I think police, it's the easiest way to get the most amount of authority. So I think they recruit a lot of trigger happy people that, that want authority over people the easiest way that they can. And I think that's, that's kind of messed up. It's more about um, what policing, they look for type A personalities. They look for alphas, they look for people who can come in and control situations. And that's the issue is like when you're calling a cop to come to a scene, you're calling for someone to come and, and control a situation, but not every situation requires control. Everybody knows that some situations require compassion. Some situations require talking. Some, some situations require humor. Like this is a personality, like you have to be personality to be a cop you're in public service you're dealing with people so your interactions are not all going to be confrontational some of your interactions are you know somebody's having a bad day are you going to put them in cuffs and take them in a cruiser it doesn't make sense you know it's 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 not it, the problem is it's too generalized and you keep throwing in your money and trying to get more police and more equipment that's not the answer to the solution it's, it's recruiting education social service mental health, but these are the things you need to invest in and invest time and research and, and money into. But this, this structure has been like this for so long, right? Which is why they are taking so long to change it because they're like, oh, we had it like this for, for years. Yeah, you had, and it's broken. So like, yeah, like let's fix it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, going off of that, I want to, uh, touch base with Quentin on a certain topic, obviously with you being one of the hosts at, uh, and this was a very small incident that I actually pit, uh, witnessed personally and I wanted to kind of uh, get your uh, input on it. Um, I know you were, when you were hosting, there was someone, when you asked everyone to take a knee, there was someone who refused to take a knee. And uh, as you, and it was really amazing how you kind of dealt with it, but I'd, I'd love for you to share that incident. In the front, when we were all taking a knee, there was a gentleman who didn't want to take a knee, and he was white. And I could see the people around him were getting upset, obviously. And people began yelling at him and throwing things at him. And I just told people just to, you know, fight him with love, show him love. Us swinging on him and trying to beat him up is not going to make him want to kneel. If he's already, he's already undecided, maybe that's why he's standing. That's not going to 
educate him on the subject. That's just going to affirm the stereotypes he already thinks. So we just need to fight him with love, show him respect, and that's how we can now have the conversation to see, okay, why are you not standing? Because him not standing doesn't entirely mean that he's racist. doesn't entirely mean that he wants people to be murdered by the police. He could have another reason for standing. So it's just about showing love, extending that olive branch and opening the conversation. Yeah. And just inspiring uh, change with uh, love and not fear, right? <clears throat> and it was really great exactly. that you highlighted that because uh, it's kind of like we can't stoop to their level, whoever it is. Um, then, you know, how does it uh, make us any better than them, right? So we got to maintain our dignity, maintain the way we do things. And um, yeah, kind of, that's kind of um, where like the riders really have let a lot of people down with the way they have taken this, even like not riders, I'd say more like the looters <clears throat> and how they've uh, kind of used this as an opportunity to steal and, you know, riot and just, you know, saying they did it for George Floyd, but necessarily not, right? The rioters, as Martin Luther King says, a riot is the protest of the unheard. And we've been fighting this battle, this civil rights battle for so long, centuries, since the slaves were freed in the 1800s, still been fighting to this day. So people rioting, that was just their way of gaining attention. And the funny thing is, have, there hasn't been riots in the past couple of weeks. There's been countless peaceful protests in a lot of cities where the news is now no longer covering those peaceful protests because there's no riots there. So mm -hmm. they just want to portray the riots and say this is what our goal is when that's not anyone's agenda. And a lot of the rioters, there's police officers that were involved in undercover cops and people in the crowd and their sole purpose is to riot, is to instigate. Because if you look Look at what's going on right now. A lot of laws are being changed. A lot of protests are still happening and they're all peaceful because that has been the mission of the majority of people protesting. The majority of people fighting want it to be a peaceful fight. People are upset. People are hurt. Yes. But at the end of the day, we know a lot of people know that the only way to make change is through, you know, the routes that Alex is taking, getting in front of the media, sitting down with City Hall giving them real tangible steps to do. That's how we make change. Rioting and breaking the law isn't going to make anything better. Yeah. I, I, tend to, I tend to disagree. I think, you know, sometimes rioting is necessary. Um, you know, a lot of laws that have been passed in the U.S. haven't passed because there has been riots. Um, and, you know, you look at... Uh, Louisville right now, Louisville hasn't rioted, right? Louisville has not rioted and Breonna Taylor's killers have still not been arrested. So um, when it comes to rioting, I, 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 I don't condone violence, but I do condone rioting because rioting does get things done. Um, and a lot of the, the rhetoric around rioting is negative. Um, I think there's a difference between rioting and looting. You know, looting is not what we will what we're doing this for. And a lot of the looting was actually done by white supremacists pretending to be um, anti-fascists. And this is them to push their own agenda. So, you know, make sure you watch out what's going on in the media because they will spin it one way and they will try to make it look like it's the protesters doing the looting when it's not. The protesters are protesting. Even if the protests are rioting, they're fighting for a certain cause. But when it comes to looting and, and, and breaking things and stuff like that, you know, pay attention to who's doing what. Uh, you know, we, we all have social media. We all see everything in real time. We don't have to rely on the news for our news. You know, um, so, you know, be, be able to think critically of what you're seeing. And, and rioting does work. You know, I'm not, like, riding works. Riding is what got Minnesota to move on uh, George Floyd. Riding is what made LA change the defund the police. Like, it's rioting that works. In the past, you know, after MLK was killed, 
there was riots for six days, and then the, the, the Civil Rights Act was passed. I mean, people always love to use MLK as an example, but even MLK, towards the end of his life, he realized that rioting was helping. And, and, and you, you might, I don't know if it was him on his own realization, I'm not in his head. And I don't know, maybe if it even was, you know, Malcolm X and, and the way he approached things, but, you know, peaceful protesting doesn't work. It doesn't bring about change. It doesn't put pressure on anybody. You can peaceful protest forever and never have to address anything. You just go, oh yeah, they're peacefully protesting. But it's not hurt. You know? I think um, and, and we have to, I think you, there's there is some truth to what you're saying, uh, but I think even at, even now with um, you know we're we're not just fighting one battle. It's uh, there's another battle with COVID uh, taking place at the same time, and <clears throat> that's where my personal issue really was. Where I you know uh, and I'm not afraid to kind of take the stand on this. Where I felt you know yes, it's it's extremely important that we stand up for Black Lives and. Uh, you know, for this uh, for this movement that's taking place, and we fight for this change to happen. But you know, at what cost uh, are we? Do we have to sacrifice lives of the elder, or or the ill, or children potentially, to make that change? Right, and um, it's kind of it's it's a very controversial topic where you know, protesting during COVID, is it the right thing to do, and is it not the right thing to do? So. I want to hear you guys. Uh, hear you guys' opinion on that. People are being. Oh, let's go ahead. Well, I think um, the reason why people are protesting is because they are not confined to their day to day anymore. You know, nobody is working. We're seeing that. You know, if if an individual doesn't work, society can't work, right? These companies that rely on, you know, on, on, on marginalized pay and, you know, frontline workers can't operate if the people who operate them aren't working. And what people are starting to realize that subconsciously. They're realizing that, you know, I'm the catalyst to whatever business I'm working for, you know. So there's so much power in that. And that's why these protests have been so much more amplified is because right now society is at a standstill, right? And we take that into consideration. Some people are willing to risk their life or risk these lives for what's right. And that's what it comes down to when you're protesting, when it comes down to this fight, is what are you willing to sacrifice for the betterment of humanity? You know, that's what it comes down to. You know, nobody knew that it would be like this. Nobody knew that COVID would have this effect. Nobody knew that George Floyd would ha have this interaction with the police that would lead to this. Nobody knew this, right? But now that it's there, it forces you to stand up on your on your values. And you're either fighting this fight or you're not fighting this fight. You're either for humanity or you're not for humanity, right? It's, it's really, it's, it's black and white. It's, it's black and white. There's no other way to put it. There's no gray area with this. And so, I tend to disagree. I'm going to quickly disagree with you on one point where you say it is for humanity, not for humanity. But because think of it this way, like, I guess maybe preventing COVID, do you also think that wouldn't that be also for humanity? Wouldn't you say, you know, you know, we're preventing the loss of lives by just isolating and maybe, for example, just, you know, hypothetically someone not protesting uh, by preventing the loss of life. Wouldn't you say that's also for humanity? Well, I'm going to ask you this. Did the government handle COVID effectively? Uh, yeah, I guess um, somewhat yes and no. Yeah, mix yes of both. Yes and no, right? It's a mix of both, right? So if the government wasn't able to give you a definitive answer on handling a pandemic, because they opened society right around when everybody started protesting. So regardless of if there was protests or not, they were putting the people at risk regardless. Like mm -hmm. you, they made the decision to open society up. You know, so they're going to want to blame this, the, the spikes on the protests. Yeah. But society opened before any of these protests started. So if there's any spikes, could you attribute to this protest? Yeah, you can. But 
the government also said, hey, we're opening back the economy up, right? We want people to go back to work, despite what we've said about how dangerous this virus is. So for people to sit there and have to make that choice is based on their, their own critical thinking. Because the government has, has, has not really been able to deliver a proper stance on it, which I think Trudeau's done a fanta- fantastic job. I think Tr- Justin Trudeau's done a great job with everything he's done. But the fact of the matter is the government doesn't even know what it's dealing with. So how can you, you know, how can you, you know, polarize a subject when, when they've already put you in harm's way? You know what I mean? It, it's really yeah. hard to say, hey, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go protest because you know, COVID is, is deadly, you know, because society's already made the decision for us. They open everything. We're about to go to phase three, soon, right? Yeah. But Edmonton's just past Calgary in, in, in active cases. You know, yeah. I went and got tested today because everything, everything's back to normal. People are wearing masks and stuff, but like nobody knows what's going on. Yeah. You know, so and definitely uh, people can also just, uh, you know, if, if the government does make some sort of action or change, you know, people wouldn't have to protest, right? They could prevent exactly. protesting or reduce it by taking some sort of change if they really do see uh, a spike. And I, and I think that's where I can definitely say the government is held accountable. But I want to hear uh, yeah. Clinton's thoughts on the same topic as well. I feel like people have been quarantining from the beginning since March and they have gotten the virus. There are people who have not been in contact with anybody, not gone to the grocery store, none of that. And they still got sick or their family members got sick. So being at home and living in fear isn't gonna keep you safe from the virus. I got friends on my Snapchat, on my Instagram, my my homies down in the States. These guys have been renting out mansions like every week and throwing parties. And there's like 100, 150 people like every week since March, every weekend. These guys are going hard. And like big cities like Vegas, LA, like Miami, you see the beaches, you see what's going on. Like those who want to stay at home will stay at home, protest, civil rights, groceries, anything. They'll find a reason to stay at home. But those who want to be out will come out. And those who value this cause, because like you said, lives are being lost either way. Breonna Taylor was in bed and she was murdered. You know, she just worked a 12-hour shift at a hospital as a nurse, a frontline worker in this pandemic. And now she became a victim of another pandemic for being at home when supposedly the hospitals are more deadly. So we can't live in fear. Those who want to come out will come out and have come out and made it vocal. And of course we took precautions, you know, there were, there were medics on site, people were handing out masks, hand sanitizer. We did what we could, but like Alex said, the government opened up the province already. People have been living freely already. I've been going out every day. I do my best to like go for a walk, you know, get some fresh air, watch the sunset, whatever. And parks are busier than ever. Like all these nice outdoor parks and lookout spots are so busy. These places used to be dead last year, years before. And now everyone's out because they're just tired of being cooped up in their homes. So I don't think COVID, I don't think COVID is a valid reason not to protest, not to go out and make your voice heard. Yeah, that uh, reminds me, I believe the Alberta government, uh, just banned something like protesting on roads and sidewalks or something like that in certain areas and it seems kind of uh like not uh the best thing to do right now what do you guys think of that so i was actually reading this bill again because i the language in it is so vague basically what it does is it bans you from protesting on essential infrastructure so they say highways, they don't say sidewalks. They say highways, okay. but uh, what, they, uh, what they do and what I think it was designed for was for, uh, what's it called? Uh, pipelines. It says pipelines. Or it says anything oh, to okay. the oil and gas infrastructure. 
and we know that the pipeline battle is, is you know, the indigenous people are fighting that battle. And that protest, that bill is for, is, is geared towards them. It's geared to pacify them. It doesn't really affect uh, the BLM protests. Um, yeah. As you've seen, you know, anything that has to do with, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement is usually done in the streets. Um, it's not done on grand pipelines and stuff like that. So this is a tactic from the government to, to silence the indigenous people because they have a problem and which by all means they should, you know, protest against um, yeah. the pipelines being built on their land, right? Um, yeah, so that, from what I understand, from what I've read in the, in the bill, that, that is more geared toward testing is your constitutional right, you know, your charter rights, you know, so to take away free speech from these people whose land you've already taken, now you're trying to take away their, their voices, like, mm-hmm. hey man, it's some sticky business, you know. I definitely yeah. see it as a scare tactic by the government because not a lot of people know a lot about Bill 1, so people will assume, okay, it's going to affect these Black Lives Matter protests. And that's kind of what the police have been trying to push. They, you know, they've been trying to scare people. They don't educate you on it. They just let you know it's out there and keep it vague to instill fear in you. So people are thinking if they go to these marches, future marches and protests, if there's going to be any, that they'll be fine. I was out on this um, this weekend on Saturday. I was at um, United Cycle at the Carmi. I'm sure you guys all know of it. The Edmonton Carmi. Yeah. There's like hundreds of people there. You know, no one got fined, ticketed, people revving in the engines, doing burnouts, all sorts of things. And it went on till like three in the morning, as it always does on Fridays and Saturdays. So the, the police and Jay, not the police, sorry, the government, Jason Kenney's government, putting that bill out now is an attempt to scare those who don't know what's going on with the bill because they just see it as a protesting bill. They don't look further into it. Yeah. Getting out of, uh, so yeah, great points there. And uh, thanks for bringing that up, Jaden. I actually saw that recently and I did have some questions that these guys just clarified, but I want to kind of um, get get more personal out of these just factual uh, things that are happening right now. Obviously you guys are two um, black gentlemen that grew up in, in Canada and I want to hear your personal stories on the racism you experienced growing up. Um, you know, even Clinton, I know, you know, we went to the same high school. You uh, played so much hockey. There's so many problems with racism in hockey, right? Um, so I guess I want to hear your guys' personal stories, uh, starting off with Clinton. Just, you know, what did you guys experience growing up? Sorry, you cut out there in the last 10 seconds. Oh, uh, I just said, uh, you know, I said, um, I've seen you, you know, we went to the same high school. I've seen you in, um, in Skona and even just being a black gentleman growing uh, in, uh, growing up in Edmonton, you know, uh, even just Canada in general, what was that experience like for you? Because I want to hear more raw and personal stories from you guys and your experience. Skona was extremely racist. Yeah. I'm put that out there. And <laughs> I can second that actually right off. You the know, it was that. man. I, even with everything going on, I've been reconnecting with a lot of people from Skona. And my graduating class of 2014, there were like 10 black kids max. You know, not even. And we've just been talking about like what's going on, and a couple other schools in the south too. I'm like, yo, like low key, our high school is racist. And this friend will be like, yeah, it really was. For me, when I came to Skona, like you know, you said I was playing hockey, man, like AAA, taking up seven days of my week. Plus, I was working two jobs. I didn't really know anyone at school. I had, like, a family friend that went to school, and I knew a couple of the black kids because there's barely any. Like, one of them I went to junior high with. The other was a family friend. The other, like, I met, you know, like, everyone just knew everyone. So within my first month of being at school, I get pulled out of class, taken to Miss Fuller's office, and I get told, like, she's there and the constable's there, and they tell me I'm on a watch list. And I'm like so confused. I'm like, what do you mean I'm on a watch list? Like, what I do? They're like, well, the people you hang out with, so you're on a watch list. And that made no sense to me. I had no previous history of anything at that school or at my previous school because I was at Vimy for four years before that. And, you know, I just moved because I wanted to change up the experience of being out of Vimy. So that threw me off. And just going through Skona, 
you just are you're just reminded like those microaggressions you're just reminded that you're different like i grew up in riverbend i grew up around a lot of these kids but i'm not coming to school on my parents porch you know i'm i'm on the bus with my photocopied bus pass hoping the driver doesn't take it away like and these kids just don't see the disconnects and that's where we need a we need a fixed educational system starting here in the province in the uk there's a mandatory course in high school and it's about religious beliefs and it talks about many different religions and different cultures and every student needs to take this course to graduate here in alberta we have a similar course but it's an option and this course hasn't been updated since 1999 and only two schools, only two high schools in the whole province offer this course. So we need a fixed educational system. We need to educate kids so that whether you go to a school that is predominantly white or predominantly black or predominantly First Nations, you can get educated on the other cultures and other people in Canada because Canada is so diverse. It doesn't matter how undiverse your pocket might be you're gonna go into the world and see different cultures different races different religions and you can't discriminate against them yeah, yeah and and that's a good thing to point out too is uh i find uh you can just look around and there's so much uh there's people oppressing people because of their religion too and that's that's not a good thing at all either Alex, I, I'd love to hear more about you as well. You know, your any personal stories that you have, you know, growing up in Canada and any experiences that you have to share. <laughs> oh man, um, where do I start? Uh, you know, I grew up in Toronto. Uh, Toronto is a melting pot. I went to a predominantly black high school. I went to two high schools. My second high school was a little more mixed, but both my high schools were in the inner city. Um, and uh, I grew, also grew up in the inner city. So a lot of the things I experienced and saw a lot of people around me had experienced as well. Um, I think I've been pulled over probably, you know, 10 plus times, you know, just for, being black, you know, there's things you have to do as a precaution as a black man in, in, in Toronto. Um, you know, I, never, I used to get in the car before I put my seatbelt on. I used to take my fitted cap off, you know, because I knew, I knew how these police thought. You know, if they see a black guy driving a car, they're going to come take that license plate and pull you over. And, you know, that's happened to me several times. I've had my car searched. I've been accused of stealing my own mom's car and spray painting a different color. Uh, I've, <laughs> I've, uh, I've seen the police beat up my friends. I've seen the police kill somebody before, uh, shoot a black man, just like that. And you know, I've seen all of it. And um, I, I, a lot of people think this stuff is like just in movies. You know, but this shit was shit I was seeing. Excuse my language. Um, are we allowed to swear? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Too late. Um, <laughs> no, go ahead. Now. I'm just kidding. I'm just um, kidding. <laughs> go for it. This stuff was stuff like I was seeing, you know, day in, day out. You know, I, you know there was police officers at my school. You know, there was all the stuff that, you know, we're talking about and that you see on the news. is stuff that, you know, I've been seeing from a, a young age. And, uh, you know, you're exposed to that stuff. You think that stuff is just whatever, you know, you brush by it, you take it as it comes. But uh, the fact of the matter is it traumatizes you. You know, it, it really traumatizes you and it gives you this, uh, it gives you, it, it also stigmatizes the police. You know, when, when now, you know, when I drive, I'm uh, a model citizen. You know what I mean? But I still, when I pull up to a police officer, you know, my ask is tight. You know, I don't know what they're going to look over and, and say to me. You know, this is just, it, this is this is an effect of so much trauma from all the other experiences I've seen and had myself. And, you know, it's, it, it obviously has a negative impact. It has a negative impact on your 
and your social and your daily life and, and, and of course people grow skeptical of police and, and and these people that come into your communities that don't belong there you know what i mean um when i was i don't remember what age i was but uh at a certain age my mom sat me down and had that conversation about dealing with police you know um it's a it's almost like in my parents my, my mom talked to me about dealing with police before she talked to me about sex and stuff like that you know what i mean so the fact that somebody has to have that conversation with their son about how to you know maneuver in these situations is, is, is a nuance of a much 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 bigger issue you know and my experiences reflect that you know the things i've seen reflect that um so that's what really has made me more um, vocal about this stuff because I've seen it from both sides. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been up here, I've, you know, when the George Floyd thing happened, you know, I broke down in tears because, you know, I understood exactly what, what that's about. I understood it because I've seen it, you know, I've seen it. It's, it, it's lynching, it, that's what it is, bottom line, it's, it's lynching. You know, so when you, when that can channel memories and, and past traumas and stuff like that, you know, I, I never look at myself as a victim, but, you know, to sit there and act like that shit didn't, you know, shape any of my outlook or, or have any effect on me as an individual would be a disservice to my people, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I do have many experiences. Uh, people close to me have many experiences and, yeah. you know first hand and second hand and, 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 and you know that's kind of why I, I started my platform was to speak on what I was seeing um it wasn't to tackle police brutality at the forefront you know that wasn't what I built my platform for but that's what my platform has become a centerpiece of it's been from a centerpiece to fight uh this fight so that's why I just continue to use it and that's how I draw from my experiences so. yeah and it's, um, you know, what really hit me is just you and your parents having to have that talk with you about how you can protect yourself from the police. And it just sounds absurd when you say that, right? Why would you need to protect yourself from the police? The police is there to protect you, right? And um, it's, um, it's unfortunate, man. And, you know, I think, I think there is progress being made. And I think that's what I want to talk about next. You know, what has changed from all these protests taking place and, for the last couple of weeks since it started until now, you know what has changed um, in terms of obviously we know like the officers that have been fired, but what other systemic changes have happened? Well, we've seen uh, LA defund their police by 100 million, uh, which is good. Uh, Minnesota has dismantled their police force, so they've wiped cleaned house. Um, Toronto has made some changes, but there needs to be more changes being made. Like the, the Canada, Canada can't be complacent in this. Um, the fact that Edmonton is having the conversation is a step, but we do not want to let them off the hook. You know, we're seeing that laws can be changed overnight. That's what's happening in the Laws are being changed overnight, literally. So, with that being the case, then we know that that's feasible here. Right. And which is why, you know, people like you that have a platform uh, have to, you know, keep pushing this conversation forward, you know, taking action, you know, signing petitions, sending the emails, reaching out to city councilors, speaking at, at these meetings, you know, that's, that's what needs to happen so that, hey, you know, we're uniting together to, to make change because we all do want to make change. And our voice is amplified when the 10,000 of us saying, you know, as opposed to one of us. You know, even though I've been done doing these interviews and talking to everybody, you know, I can't, I, I reiterate all the time, I can't do this by myself. You know, I'm one man and I'm willing to open all the doors for everybody to fight this fight for us. But um, the conversation's happening. There are changes being made. There's a petition about uh, the Don Knott School. I was named after a KKK member. There's a petition about Oliver Square, you know, 
Frank Oliver was a slave owner too, I believe, or uh, something along those lines. You know, um, you know the Winston Churchills and all these. You know, it's it spans from it's a wide timeline. You know, it's a very very wide timeline from the the, the, the inception of Canada, the colonialism, all the way to right now, and we have to fix everything in between, one thing at a time. So. I think we are going to make some change and I feel like we are going to make some progress and a lot of beautiful things are going to come from this if we keep applying pressure and if we keep our foot on the gas. But if we start to get complacent, if we start to go back to our lives, how they were pre-COVID, which was, you know, a lot of people just mindlessly doing stuff to stay alive, right? I I hope COVID has shown people that when you strip yourself of that day-to-day you know, you have to ask yourself, who are you and what are you willing to stand on? You know, mm-hmm. That's one thing that COVID has done for me. You know, I'm, I'm a guy, I work, uh, I'm a family business, you know, I own podcasts, I have all these other things I'm doing. But, you know, when, when the world stopped and I had to ask myself, you know, what are the principles I stand on? I had to face that. You know, I really had to face that. And, that, and I hope that everybody else had to have that that too because that is what's important and if you are able to have that and are you able to accept that maybe the way you were living like might not have helped the purpose that you've been searching for that now it it has Mm -hmm. amen bro and uh i know you talked a little bit about what needs to change and uh obviously there's a lot of you know, it's like opening a can of worms. There's so many, <clears throat> there's so many gaps to fill, right? So many holes to fill. And I want to hear from both of you. You know, what is the what is the next next step that we all have to take together? Because, like you said, it's a step by step. It's not going to change overnight. It's not going to change over a couple of weeks. <clears throat> it's it's a it's a long term process. But what is the next step for everyone to take in? Even for us uh, as a society to execute on, not just thoughts, not just sharing a post on our Instagram story, but what action can we all take as a collective and even on an individual basis to make this change for the most important next step? Uh, Well, as a collective, we can just continue to have the conversation, continue to let people know and hold people around us accountable. And ways of doing that are signing petitions, sharing things on social media. We're, like Alex said, I don't watch the news. Straight up, I don't watch the news. I haven't watched the news, I don't think, ever. All the information I get is from my phone, is from social media, from Twitter, from Instagram. And we need to be sharing things on our Twitter, on our Instagram, still letting people know this issue has not gone away. It's only been a couple of weeks since everything's come to the forefront, you know? We're only in the beginning. Plus, it's been several hundred years that we've been fighting. We're only in the beginning. We got to keep the conversation going. As individuals, me, as I can speak for myself as an artist, I just got to keep it going. I got to keep using my platform to bring awareness to this. I just dropped a song today and it's talking about the Breonna Taylor case and a couple other cases. And mm-hmm. I just need to continue using my voice and my platform in a way that will educate people because not everyone's going to see the same things that I see on social media. Not everyone's going to watch the news, but music is still something that everyone's listening to. And my fan base they're young they're very moldable so i want to bring awareness to them issues that they might not know but they need to know and they need to have conversations with their friends and their family um i think you know yeah it's action actionable items you know signing petitions um sharing the information but i think the biggest thing is uh you know everybody's good at something different and you never know where your skill set can come in handy or with who it can come in handy with. Um, and that's why, you know, if you see people trying to advocate for change, you know, reach out to them and see if they need help because this stuff is not a one person battle. It might take two, three, 10, 20, 20, 30 people to take on these things. And, you know, there's a role in this fight for everybody, you know, so if there's something you're particularly good at, and you think you can help the cause using your skill set, you know, reach out to somebody that is fighting this fight and, and ask them if, 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 if you can be of use to them in this fight. You know, um, um, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm only good at one thing and other people are good at their respective things. And, and when people come together, teamwork makes the dream work, you know? So mm -hmm. I think, you know, outside of sharing and signing, you know, if you do have something that you're particularly good at, that you pride yourself on or that, you know, you want to, you want to be resourceful and help out, you know, there's a lot of organizations that can use an extra hand. There's a lot of individuals that can use an extra hand. There's everybody's trying to fight this fight, you know, and you can see who's trying to fight it. And it's, it's, it's offering yourself as an ally is, 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 you know, helping to you know leverage your privilege and your abilities and your strengths to this fight, you know, because the more people involved, the easier it's going to be to, to, to tackle this, you know, there's a lot of resistance, right? So that's why we got to come together to do this. I agree. Yep. Clinton, you still with us, man? Uh, don't see you on the video. I'm still, I'm still here. I just have to charge my phone, so it's oh, no worries, no worries. Um, well, I guess it's a good time to charge your phone because, uh, you know, we're just about to wrap up and, um, you know, going off of going off of um, you know on the on on an end note, I'd want I'd love to hear what um, what final I guess words you guys have to say on this topic and what message you'd like to share with the people that are watching. Okay, you want to go first? I want to share with people that the fight is not over; it's far from over, and. Where we are here in Edmonton, Alberta, protesting will not take us anywhere because we don't have the energy to keep protesting. What we need to do are create steps that we can take, plans that we can present to our city councilors, our MLAs. We need to put pressure on them to change laws. We need to vote. And as individuals, we need to hold ourselves and those around us accountable. Perfect. Yeah, I, I wouldn't change a word, man. Um, man, it's, this is a long battle. It's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, it's a stressful battle. It's been stressful for me. Uh, so I can only imagine everybody else that's doing this too. Um, and that's why we do have to come together. You know, we got to be in the room. You know, any chance we get where our, our voice counts, and it starts from, it does start from voting. You know, when you vote, you're, 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 speaking, you're, you're speaking your turn. You know, and, and if you don't vote, then you have no right to really complain about what's going on in society because you didn't choose to get up and, and, and make your voice heard when it counted. So, you know, it starts with those things. And then there's times that, that you can speak in front of public council, you know, and you feel like you're qualified to speak. If it's the conversation you want to have at home, have the conversation at home. But we cannot let this momentum die down. We need to keep putting our foot on the gas to drive change. Um, you know, we got a petition over the gifted gab, sign it. We've got demands on our website for what we would like to see change in society as well. Um, you know, we we are we are just you know an entity that believes in equality. Uh, we're not speaking anything radical. We just want an equal playing field, as everybody else does. And, you know, I, I challenge people to ask themselves, you know, what, what is it that you're going to stand on? What principles are you willing to stand on? And, and how are you going to define yourself? And are you willing to die by that? You know, it's, it's deeper than just the individual. You know, we're not doing this just for us. Like, I'm right now, if... if society was to carry on, I don't know if I would bring a kid into this world. It would just be too much stress, you know? So I need to, I know that I need to be the change that I want to see in this world. And that's why I've kind of, you know, taken it upon myself to speak on these issues. And, and, and even though I might not be the one to make the change, I would definitely 100% open the door for somebody who will be able to make that change. So just keep having the conversation and keep holding people accountable and just one, one day at a time, one conversation at a time. For him, man, like you said, it's a, it is a marathon and um, just, just keep having those conversations, keep taking action and can't let down. No. 
And, uh, and before I say any closing remarks, I want to hear from Jaden as well. You know, what does he have to think and what's his perspective on what we need to do as a community? Uh, so for me, I saw uh, David Goggins made a post and I think getting everyone to talk about it and getting the more privileged uh, communities to talk about it. Uh, he said that really gets the ball rolling. Um, and yeah, because if certain communities are staying, or certain groups of people, I should say, are just staying um, silent about this, then, then, then there's still work to be done, obviously. And, and yeah, and, and also taking it a step further than social media. Don't just post on social media, like go out there and, and get stuff done because because really, uh, it's it's uh, it's your human right to to be free from oppression. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's my thought. It's humanity, yeah. man. It's not about politics. And um, just to touch on what you're saying, man, like, you know, white people are our allies. You know, this is, this stuff begins and ends with you guys. You know, if, if, if white people are having this conversation and then they're acknowledging what's going on, then, you know, it makes, it amplifies everything, right? Because the way the system is set up, it sets up to benefit white people, right? So when white people are involved in the conversation and they're saying, hey, this isn't, this isn't supposed to be like this, it, 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 it takes what, you know, the black community and the South Asian community and, and the other community are saying, and it amplifies it tremendously because the people at the forefront of you know the politics, all the people in the rooms are are white, you know, and 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 when white people speak on it, it 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 says something. It says it says something. It says that we're not just crazy black people complaining. It's it's that it says that you know you guys see that we're tired. You guys see that we're fed up. You guys see that the, the scales are lopsided. And, you know, we appreciate you, all, each and every one of you, who are fighting this fight with us. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well said, guys, for sure. And, um, you know, I think uh, personally for me, the biggest motivation has been just even just thinking about the future and uh, imagining a scenario where, you know, if I have children in the future or even just nieces and nephews or anyone who's young, you know, comes up to me and says, you know, what did you do? You had an opportunity to bring change and create equality for a, a whole race. And um, you know, how did you participate? What what action did you take? Right? What, what steps did you take? What what did you execute on to make that happen? <clears throat> and I think it's uh, not just for ourselves, but also creating this change for the generations to come, so they don't have to, you know, like like you said, Brianna Taylor, they don't have to sleep. And, and fear they don't have to go on a jog go on a jog in fear they don't have to breathe in fear right so it's it's all about you know being able to create this positive bright future for these younger generations that are going to come up in the in the coming years and you know we have to take that responsibility on our shoulders now because we're the only ones capable to do it now so that's my that's my two cents <clears throat> on this but going off of that i think it was absolutely um, a pleasure having you guys on i thank you you know personally I, I got to learn so much from both of you i think you guys have done absolutely tremendous work for the cause whether it's about speaking up or sharing or whether it's about being on stage executing clinton whether it's about clinton being uh, at a protest three hours before it's supposed to happen or you know, dropping off decals uh, with the black fist um, all over the city, or whether it's Alex talking about his work <clears throat> with uh, at the at the at his podcast and just doing news interviews, getting involved with the activism and speaking out and helping other you know uh, setting an example, being a role model. So I think <clears throat> it was really a pleasure having you guys both on, sharing your wisdom and knowledge, your experiences learning from them and being able to have the opportunity to share this. Appreciate you for giving us a platform, man. Um, 
I love what you're doing. Um, you know, giving a voice to leaders and, and, and people that are trying to make an impact. And, and kudos to you for, you know, putting that in the spotlight. Um, it's not easy to go out there and start your own start your own podcast <laughs> I can't you know it. I can't you know it all. I can <laughs> I can attest to it it's that's, a, that's a whole different podcast that's a whole different podcast <laughs> but you know what you're you're doing it and you're using it for the right reasons and you know you should, that's, uh, I'm pretty sure that's how you sleep at night so you know keep doing what you're doing thank you brother thank you yeah I'm happy to be on here man happy that you reached out you've been supporting even before all this you've been extremely supportive of my music and of the black community and of the college communities you've been supportive in so many different communities so thank you for presenting us this opportunity to come on here and speak and educate you know educate you and educate your fans thank you man it's um i'm truly grateful for you know even even meeting leaders like you uh future leaders current leaders to be honest and um, being able to share your influence share your voice i think you guys are the true game changers of our generation and it was really a pleasure it was really really awesome having you guys on appreciate you man thank you god bless you man note, thank you bro um and on that note um this is it for a podcast it was a bit of a longer one but thank you guys for watching uh it was really important for us to have this conversation go deep, dig deep, and understand, you know, what are the root causes, uh, understanding why we need to protest, understanding why, um, you know, what the problems are in our system. And, um, you know, hoping you guys stay safe with COVID-19 still out there, stay inspiring through isolation, um, keep protesting. Um, you know, it's, it's a long race that we have to run, so keep going. And thank you guys so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, and follow, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Bye-bye.